Okay, now we go to spiritual welfare. The distribution of graces. You know, uh, it's amazing how uh, sometimes abuses create problems. Like uh, he, here in the U.S., we have what we call a welfare system, okay? And welfare is never good, it's a very good, never bad, it's a very good thing. But because the system is abused, okay, and then people who don't need it get it, and whatever, those who need it don't get it, then we think it's very bad. Okay? But some things are not bad in themselves, it is the practice. Okay? So God does it. In the Acts of the Apostles, they did it. Remember the Apostles appointed um, how many deacons? Uh -huh. To do what? Yeah, to, do to do welfare. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. to do, yes, to do welfare. Okay? Yeah. But always as you know, with every system, once it has to do with money, material things, and whatever, greed will crop in. And then... Okay, so distribution of grace. Does God give all human beings sufficient grace to be saved? Yes. Whether you so, take it. So that God gives all human beings grace sufficient to be saved follows or flows or follows from what we have just seen, namely that God sincerely desires the salvation of all. So in his what we call absolute will, yes, he wills. And it's therefore, he can't will and not give. You see that? I will, but uh, he's not like us. You know, I, I, I want to do something you know, for, for that person. Okay? But we don't do it for years. But we want to do it. When God wants it, he does it. Mm -hmm. So if he wishes that all be saved, he gives all the help that they need in order to attain that end. So none of us can say, oh well, God gave her more, but me, uh, I think I'm lacking. <laughs> no. However, as we have just seen, that will for the salvation of humans is not, is, not, is not absolute, but conditioned. That is on the person's response to God's grace. Theologians distinguish between graces that are approximately and remotely sufficient. Okay, these distinctions you know, are very important because they clarify okay, certain things. So, approximately sufficient grace is that supernatural help of God, e.g., enlightenment, enlightenment of the mind, prompting and a strengthening of the will, etc., that fully equips one to place a salutary act here and now. Approximately sufficient. In the here and now, I'm first with a decision either to be angry, impatient, or to practice patience. In the here and now, Horace is giving me a hard time. Now, okay, so I need grace now. now. Uh -huh. Okay, and God will provide it now. Then, remotely sufficient grace is grace that does not yet give sufficient help for the performance of a given salutary act, a gift lives chastely, but prepares one to receive that grace. One is not living chastely now, but God is offering the grace, okay, for them to get there. Okay? For example, a sinner, not yet ready to give up a life of sin, receives the grace to pray for help, remotely sufficient grace, like Augustine. God, I want to convert, but not, not yet. <laughs> we, are, we all are like that in our vices, yeah, yeah. all of us. We may not yeah. say, speak, talk about it, mm -hmm. but we have that tendency. Yeah? Because there is some apparent good which is attracting us to something. Okay? Yeah, I want to give it up. I want to give it up. Okay? I'm serious about it, but not yet. Abuse. You're abusing God, you think. Okay. So, he prays, someone prays, he, she prays, and then receives the grace to turn away from
from sin. Okay? Approximately sufficient grace. In time of temptation, one may not find in oneself strength to resist. But one can pray for that strength and will surely receive it if one perseveres in prayer. In that case, the inspiration to pray would be a remotely sufficient grace to overcome the temptation. I'm in a mess, but I want out. So in the midst of the mess, I am praying. You see that? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So that is remotely sufficient grace. God, I don't see a way out, but I don't want to be here. I don't want to live my life like this. Help me. Remotely sufficient grace. Okay? Then God will offer the grace and then it becomes proximate as I move out of this mess. So the grace given in response to that prayer would be proximately sufficient grace. Okay? So we need, even in our, in our sinfulness, when I'm caught up in sin, I can't say, well, I'm... Do you, you notice how the devil um, works on us? If we are in sin, the devil will tell you, well, you're going to sin anyway. Yeah? Just do it. How often do we say, oh, well, I'm sinning, I'm sinning anyway, I'm sinning anyway, so... Why resist it now? Okay, I will just go to confession later. Okay, I'll just go to confession later. Let me just do it. All just to give up. I've been praying, well, God doesn't offer the grace. Oh, well, I'll just sin. Time will come. I'm still young. I still have some years. Never know. So I don't really need to pray now to get out of this. I need to pray now. Even if I don't see a way out, I need to pray. Okay? That is called remotely sufficient grace. We should use all grace, okay? Available. So when God offers, you know, when I'm, I'm ready to receive, I'm disposed, then grace will become proximate. The here and now. Holy Scripture urges us to pray for help in every need, but especially in time of temptation. Why should we pray more in times of temptation? Get the help to avoid it. Why is temptation in essence? You know, the devil, the devil is not stupid. Okay? Uh, well, he's stupid, but uh, he's... he's <laughs> uh, well, well, what should we say? Hmm? He knows, okay? They're weak. He's very cunning. Okay? He knows when we are weak. When we are strong, very strong, it's not going to bother. The devil is, hmm, what would we say? Again, we can't, we can't uh, accord to the devil these virtues. But for lack of words, we can say he's patient. He's cunning. <laughs> he's cunning, cunningly patient. So he can just watch, observe. He's like a spy. Okay. He, he observes and waits and waits and waits until we are really weak. Look at the temptations of Jesus. Okay, for 40 days he was in the desert, fasting and whatever. When he was hungry, that's when the other guy showed up. When he was hungry. Okay. When we are sick, in illness, moments of illness, that's when he strikes. That's why whenever someone is seriously ill, we have to call a priest to give this person the sacrament of anointing, to receive the strength of the Holy Spirit, because the devil is right there, okay? trying to weaken an, an, an already weak person, trying to weaken the will. If God loves me, why am I suffering like this? Is there really heaven beyond this kind of mess? Okay. So that's why we need, that's the temptation, we need prayer more there. We need all the strength we can get. This is one of the petitions of the Our Father, which we should pray with special earnestness. What do we pray in the Our Father? Not to, 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 to. Prevent our falling. 
Lead us not into temptation. Prevent our folly. Because we are weak human beings. Without your help, we are down. Okay? Then does God give equal grace to all? So we said he offers sufficient grace to all, right? Okay, that's true. Does he offer equal grace to all? Does sufficient mean equal? No. So does he offer e equal grace to all? Okay. So let's look and see. We are inclined to think that if God is to be fair, as we say, you are not fair, you are not fair. <laughs> Usually, husbands tell wives they are not fair. Wives tell husbands they are not fair. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> Who are the wives? The husbands. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, you know, social living fairness is, is in the heart of the beholder. <laughs> you are not fair to me, you are not fair to me. Okay? So we're inclined to think that if God is to be fair, he must give the same abundance of grace to all. But as a matter of fact, he does not. Okay? Although he gives everyone grace sufficient for salvation, he does not give the same amount of grace to all. Okay? Do we have the new text? The new notes? Yes. Okay? Page 167. Have. So, we go again following our formula, Holy Scripture first. We go to Holy Scripture to stress that God doesn't give the e an equal amount of grace. And that doesn't make God unfair. Okay? So, Scripture stresses that God is master of his gifts and remain free to give them to whomever he chooses and in whatever measure he wishes, although he never deprives any creature of what is its due meaning, of what it needs to be saved. Okay. So God look around and say, well, God is fair. Look at what he did to the other person and to me. But unfortunately, we do it. So one reason why God gives grace more abundantly to some than that is done, than, than to others is to make us realize that all grace is purely His gift and that we can place no demands on what He is to give us. Remember that parable of workers who were idle in the morning at nine and the last bunch was in the evening. They worked only for an hour. The way it, when it came to give, God gave as he wanted. And then the others complained. Yeah. Can't I do with my money whatever I want? Are you jealous because I'm generous? Hmm? So, we should receive with grateful hearts whatever grace God gives us. With no complaint that he may have given others gifts that he has not given to us. Okay. You know, like, you know, little kids, okay? Um, sometimes you give them, let's take the example of a donut, okay? In little kids, you give them donuts. So I saw one kid, a boy, there was a boy and a girl, brother and sister. So the boy pretended to eat his donut and he didn't eat it. And then he told his sister, well, oh, I'm done with my donut, it's gone. So the sister ate hers you know, quickly. And then after she ate hers, the brother pulled out his. So the sister started crying. <laughs> and then the mother came and said, well, he ate his and he told me to eat mine and now he has his. <laughs> but sometimes adults are like that, you know, concerning so many things or even worse. Worse. So the personal freedom of God in bestowing his gifts is shown in his dealings with the people of Israel. God selected them out of all the nations of the earth 
to be his own chosen people, not because of any merit on their part, but simply because he set his heart on them and made them the special object of his love, as we read in the book of De Deuteronomy. What did they do to be the so-called chosen people? Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. They are not greater than anybody. <coughs> They are not holier than anybody. Yeah, but the first one who acknowledged that there's only one God. And the God he told, told, even if you acknowledge that there's one God, it's God's grace <clears throat> that we are able to acknowledge that. Remember Simon Peter when he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God? Mm -hmm. Simon Peter, it's not flesh and blood that has revealed that to you. Yeah. So don't think you are greater than these others. It's my heavenly father. Mm -hmm. okay? So it's a special grace given to you. Not because you are more worthy than any, anyone else. Remember, it's Peter who denied him three times. At least the other ones just ran away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, God made this very clear right from the Old Covenant. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 8. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples that are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love upon you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you. It is God's love. It's God, the mystery of God's love. In choice, vocation, is the mystery of God's love. Okay? And, it, and is keeping the oath which is saw to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Okay? Deuteronomy 9, for 6. Do not say in your heart, this makes this very clear, do not say in your heart after the Lord your God has thrust, thrust them out before you, okay, meaning driven them out of the land, giving you the land. It's because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me, brought me in to possess this land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Okay? Yes, he's driving them out because of their wickedness, but you're not going in because of your righteousness either. Okay? It's God's purposes, God's choice, God's plan, which is a mystery. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you, and that he may confirm the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. <laughs> so so why, why is he giving it to them? I still love them. For his purposes. Not because they are the best. <coughs> okay? Not because they are the best. God tells them right away, you are stubborn. They are wicked, you are wicked. Okay? They are stubborn, you are stubborn. But I'm giving you this gift anyway for my purposes. So this book was written by Moses? Deuteronomy? Okay. Well, we call them hagiographers. Okay? Um, traditionally, it was said that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Yeah. Okay? This is the last book of the Pentateuch. Yeah, but uh, they, are, they are basically... Um, text that can show that really it wasn't Moses who wrote it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't make it, it's not, that doesn't say it's not divine revelation. Right. Okay? Just as we don't know who wrote the letter of the Hebrews, it doesn't make it all, then it's not divine revelation. Some texts attest to the fact that it's not really Moses who wrote this book, at least the whole of uh, the Pentateuch. Let's look at um, Deuteronomy chapter Mm -hmm. Chapter 34, the last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. <coughs> okay? 
So let's just read quickly through it and listen to it. Hmm? The last key chapter, chapter 34. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo. So you remember went to Nebo. Ellen, went to Nebo. Yes. Still there? Nebo. Yes. This mountain, we went there. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> when you go to Nebo, you see Jericho. Okay? The land where you get so. The headland of Pishgah, which faces Jericho. You see this it's when you go to Mount Nebo. Yes, it's clear there. Mm -hmm. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead, as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim, Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as Western Sea, the Negev, the circuit of the Jordan, with the lowlands at Jericho, city of palms, as far as Zohar. The Lord then said to him, This is the land which I saw to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that I would give to their descendants. I have let you feast your eyes upon it, but you shall not cross over. Why? I had sinned. I had sinned. <laughs> so there is, so there, in the land of Moab, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died as the Lord had said. And he was buried in the ravine opposite Beth Pohr in the land of Moab. But to this day, no one knows the place of his burial. Now, how could Moses have written this? Hmm. He couldn't have. Can you write an account of your death and burial? No. <coughs> no. Okay. <laughs> so you can. <laughs> yeah. So somebody else is writing this, not Moses. Joshua. Okay. So St. Paul tells us that we who have been You know what, let's stop here because we are getting into this section which will need, you know. Yes, we are reading of scripture and explanation. This Ephesian text is very, very important, Ephesians 1. So we will continue from there next time, Wednesday. Okay. Pardon? March Yeah, we are in March. Already, we are getting into March, okay. Give glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, Amen. Thanks for coming, and have a good day. Thank you, so much. Yeah. How do you say thank you, buddy? Way, buddy. Way, buddy. Way, buddy. Way, buddy. Way, buddy. Way, buddy. Way Thank you, Mr. Paparazzo, for today. <laughs>